Namaste. So today we take up uh, from Thoughts and Aphorisms, Volume 10 of Collected Works of the Mother. And this is aphorism number 10. My soul knows that it is immortal, but you take a dead body to pieces and cry triumphantly, where is your soul and where is your immortality? So this, we know that this came up uh, even in the 60s, it was very prominent. Now times have changed. People have begun to accept other dimensions. Uh, more or less, it has come into the thought process of humanity that there are other dimensions than the purely material. But there was a time, especially when uh, medical science was rising triumphantly, or so it seems, <laughs> until now we see once again, there is a search for alternate treatments. People have realized the limits and the limitations. So, uh, during that time, there was this uh, uh, debate that used to come up. One of them was that if God is there, we should be able to see him in a test tube. Uh, I remember as a child, this argument used to be there. And the whole thing was that if he can be produced in a test tube, then he won't be God, man would be God. So, this is the absurdity of this kind of argument. So all this argument centers around this premise, assumption that man is already the all-knower or to put it a little more technically that human mind is capable of knowing the truth. So this is based on the fact that human mind has discovered many things. This is also true. But what has it really discovered? Things which fall within the can of its physical senses. So the logical aspect is that whatever falls within the ken of our physical senses, human mind has analyzed it, studied it, categorized it, and thereby it has built a system of knowledge. But does it know a thing, the thing itself? Well, evidently not, because uh, if we take the, um, whether we take the creation of a book or a poem or the creation of the world, it proceeds from within outwards. As the Upanishad says, it starts from uh, some type of world or even further there is a kind of surge and uh, ultimately it begins to make the whole person um, heated up with an estrus and then there is the labor and there is the expression and the same thing uh, applies same process applies everywhere even even with the scientific mind it takes place in the same way except that for the scientist the trigger is a physical phenomena but it goes through these all these stages and then there is the expression or manifestation so, uh, this division between this is physical and therefore it is real and this is purely an imagination or this is something which is subjective, therefore not real, is a fiction and one of the proof for that is that the mind does not really create this kind of distinction as uh, the physical mind, one part of it tends to make and even that very Ignorantly, let's take an example. I know people who have uh, seen, say, an accident, roadside accident, or who have seen a horror movie, or a good comedy movie, a good film. Uh, now, much after the thing is gone, to start with, it was a film. When you have seen a film. So, technically, the mind should be able to give us an information. It is not real. Whatever horror scenes are shown, that is not real. Even I have seen people who have seen like in a movie of snakes and then they, but the mind doesn't create that kind of distinction as we create. So mind plays it like a gramophone record and the fear, even after the mind has stopped playing it, the fear, the senses respond like that. So very often, um, I mean, even as grown-ups, I know that people who have seen a horror movie, uh, they tell me that, you know, uh, suddenly when they were going out and... Uh, uh, it was night time and they suddenly felt a lot of fear. And this fear continues. That is the paradox. That okay, you felt the fear immediately because they come as clients. So therefore I know that history. That they felt afraid and this fear continues. And any amount of telling them that look here, you saw a movie. After all, <laughs> nothing is there. Yet it takes hold. Now why does it happen? There are different theories, but one of them is that actually this cinema world is a projection. Like any, all imagination is an image projected from somewhere. So the cinema is a very good example. The vibrations are projected 
and through the vibration something slips and enters into us and the human system reacts now uh, we don't understand uh, technically because there is no ghost nothing which you can see but people react and respond that way so we have a tendency to differentiate between what is a practical outer reality we can create because the senses can see it and study it and all the rest is imagination now this is where the mother and shubindu tell us that it's it's not so it's a whole continuum reality is a continuum that's how the upanishad says that it starts from a supreme reality of which nothing can be said the pragya then it enters the dream worlds hiranyagarb then the virat which is the outer manifestation in all our life it happens like that that's why uh, people say that if you imagine things they have a tendency to express now in the expression it tends to distort so but first they are felt in the inmost self somewhere so the soul being the inmost reality to expect that straight away somebody will see it outwardly then only one will believe it is concrete is expecting too much so at first the soul itself is experienced through certain signs the other day someone was asking what is the sign of purity for example so it's not about actions the person who lives in that state feels there is a term which um, uh, i don't know whether it is coined probably it is coined but i have given a new meaning to it it has it came naturally and that is holy innocence so there is in everybody a core of holy innocence which is behind all this cover and crust of ego these reactions sharp reactions and anger and this is a holy innocence like the simplicity of a child and if you touch that core of a person you will see it is the same it is something very beautiful it is untouched by all the wickedness of the world with all the evil of the world um we may use the word soul or whatever and when we have discovered this space within ourselves then we can see it experience it much more readily in others now this doesn't get reflected in the outer actions immediately outer actions are the last but it is felt inside as a kind of inner state very subjective but very real to the person who is experiencing it and uh, then later on this state which is a state of humility of deep peace an inner contentment a joy which has no conditions a love which flows without any uh, need of reciprocation or return and then it can spread into the system express in our actions manifest in thought and feelings and speech so here this aphorism is about um, those scientists who believe that material evidence is the only truth the only way to have truth nowadays we have in medicine a very wrong term evidence based medicine so the evidence is only outer so supposing a medicine is given i take this example and somebody is cured so we say that well the medicine has cured how do we know that what all was going on inside that person now it is known placebo effect which is a big chunk and many medicines possibly a large amount is placebo effect there is the dravigun also but there is something called as the inner state of the person which helps in the healing process so similarly there are inner subjective realities they are subjective in the beginning it doesn't mean that they are always subjective but later on they can take an objective form the soul can be seen for example the soul can not only be experienced uh, inwardly but can be seen it can uh, be seen also through objective changes um, in our thoughts feelings even in our physical body all this is possible and yogis experience it but scientists want to see it by dissecting the body there was a time when people believed that uh, pineal gland is the seat of the soul so this question was asked to shubindo because very often it was said in the middle of the eyebrows so shubindo says long back i have left that space and i continue to live because it was said if you shoot a person in the forehead the person will die well the person can die in so many ways <laughs> you don't have to do that people often even die out of fear so now the mother's commentary the aphorism is my soul knows that it is immortal it doesn't need proofs because it exists it's like saying somebody would ask a person do you exist so what will you say you say no i have to check your heartbeat and breathing 
fair enough but you know that you exist you are not dependent on an objective evidence of the heartbeat and the breathing so here it is my soul knows that it is immortal but you take a dead body to pieces and cry triumphantly where is your soul and where is your immortality so the mother's commentary is it has often been repeated but except in certain cases very rarely understood that only like knows like if this were understood a great deal of ignorance would vanish so if we cannot see the soul in anyone it's because we have not discovered it in ourselves that's why the mother says that the perfection you seek outside you must discover first within yourself and if you discover it within yourself you will see it more often in others so this is the whole paradox that we see the world just as we are so this is not to say that all is beautiful and everything is wonderful but there is in everything that core at least uh, to my experience so true that if you go deep enough you will feel this i have coined the word holy innocence but it could be anything <laughs> just for the joy of it something very sweet sacred and truly the person may be the worst person but if you touch this core of course there are some very hard crust and very difficult to go inside and touch this in animals is far more easier to get past because the mind and the ego are not interfering then there are some human beings in whom it's not that they are a paragon of virtues the soul has nothing to do with all that but deep inside you can feel it in some human beings it becomes easier to feel it in children it becomes very easy and that's why in children you can feel that see that in their eyes but as they grow up parents <laughs> teachers society and then slowly it is veiled covered one can see how the covering takes place so the first thing she says if you want to know that the soul exists or not you have to discover within yourself then you can discover it in the world only the soul can know the soul and on each level of being only the equivalent level can recognize the other so somebody for example who there are people who may who become cynics who say that there is no true love <laughs> well they have not discovered it within themselves if they discovered it they would see behind even the mask of hatred jealousy possessiveness still that love which has taken this distorted form like that story of mother with that sadika who threw the roses and went to uh, leave the place and the mother sends uh, vasudha ban and uh, she is very angry this sadika and wants to go away and then vasudha ban says you know what mother told you okay okay tell me not that i am going to be impressed by it and she said mother says she does not know how much she loves me now the mother could see that love behind all this action but ordinarily we just see the outer action and we cannot touch that core and therefore there are constant quarrels so she says only like can know like only the divine can know the divine and because we carry the divine in ourselves we are capable of seeing him and recognizing him and that's why the way the divine uh, calls people the way he create that arrangement uh, very often people even here they used to find it very difficult to understand why the mother has kept this person near so obviously people used to see sometimes outer behavior that to very see what we see in human being is at a point of time maybe a moment particularly with us so if somebody has been nice to us we say wonderful person <laughs> if somebody has scolded us we we say he is the worst of human being so our judgment anyways have no meaning but uh, the divine does not go by that divine goes by seeing something deep within that's what we see in krishna and arjuna's story so the divine can recognize the divine but if we try to understand something of the inner life by using our senses and external methods the result is sure to be total failure and we shall also deceive ourselves totally and this is so true of those who have a very rich inner life anyone who has begun to grow inwardly in in whatever way has a rich inner life there is a whole world or worlds that are existing inside 
and you cannot know you will see only the outer action surface act durvasa rishi used to get angry and even curse not a good habit but he was rishi nevertheless vishamitra had his own defects not an excuse for having defects but still he is the giver of the gayatri mantra so we see things outwardly but the divine sees inside and if we look and judge things only by external appearances we will never be able to understand in fact the best things are lying in the depths like the pearl within a shell or the diamond deep within the gold which is mixed with dust and one has to really go deep within to discover it so when you imagine that you can know the secrets of nature and still remain in a purely physical consciousness you are entirely deceived it is just like you see a flower you analyze each petal you break it open cut it open and try to understand what is what are the chemicals inside why there is fragrance because of this chemical what is, but you miss the joy and beauty of the flower now it is not just about joy and beauty what is this flower a result of so that's where a flower is if we can just as human beings go through a phase of inner eustress imagination followed by expression as any other artist so we can say that a cosmic being within his being has image things and then they take form and figure outwardly and there are many hands through which it passes mother has used the word formature and they distort so there is the image of strength so in its origin it is shiva mighty wonderful august calm pure he can destroy the world in a moment but outwardly when it manifests through the world's typical world then outwardly it can take the image of a grandiose asura see that's why the connection all the asuras go back to shiva and they worship him because they know this is our original image but they manage only to embody something of the rudra that too very imperfectly so that's how this world is from within outward they cannot similarly with vishnu take another example sweetness delight harmony love but what happens when it expresses outside it becomes something lack something weak something prone to a sentimentality that's why it's called as vaishnavi maya with which arjun was afflicted in the moment of war so the origin is always inside where it is undistorted as it comes down into the external manifestation it takes certain form now flowers and birds are still relatively least distorted why because they represent the soul just as mountains they represent the soul in brute material nature so when you see a mountain you know majestic or as high snow clad peaks the sun the symbol of the divine consciousness the stars as guides pointers the moon source of delight in material universe one can see that that this cosmic being has imagined and imaged there is very little distortion then you have the plant world vegetal world vegetal world the soul is in flower so you will see them relatively there you can sense that there is some truth which is deep within in some typical world the cosmic being has imaged this flower and projected upon earth that's why shubhendra says you cannot find the secret of the lotus by analyzing the mud the lotus blooms because there is a heavenly archetype from there that's what the archetype means then in the animal world you can see the birds so of course there are some birds which are but by and large by and large they are something very beautiful expressions of the uh, animal world in human beings there is similarly the outflowering takes place in the saint and the saint but that is still a rare phenomena the yogi the avatar so she says that you cannot understand the secret of nature if you remain purely in a physical consciousness physical consciousness can see it outwardly analyze it but it won't get the last secret it will be short because you bring all these things together you cannot create a flower so that's the interesting part the real experience of the real living contact is something in it 
so we have now you can have artificial flowers even with perfume they look very nice very real but there is something which is like a life giving quality something that animates the real flower it it gets dried but while it lives it is something amazing this that touch of something that will be missing so that difference one can understand and this habit of demanding concrete material proofs before accepting the reality of something is one of the most glaring effects of ignorance so when we look at it the other way round so this is imagination this is only a conception we need material proof so the other way round now this is a reality which is trying to express so you won't find material proof immediately and even if you find probably few will find always in every age there have been people who have found the soul had experience of the divine in fact it is the only empirical truth right from the beginning but this there are many who have imagined conceived thought about him it's not unreal it is reality pressing to express itself on the surface so that's why she says if you wait for material proofs you will not know that then only i will accept that's why many people in fact miss out i have seen people who had a sudden dream beautiful dream or they had uh, a passing glimpse like an image or a nice feeling Uh, they write and after writing they will say they used to write to shubhendra also but uh, perhaps this is just a feeling <laughs> and shubhendra says these are the initial touches and if you discard them and deny them that this is not real these are the little doors which are opening like small little holes in a prison dungeon cell through which we can see a ray of the sun so if you say that ray is unreal because momentarily a gap was rent and only this dark material reality is the only reality then we shut the door so we have to allow it in fact we should catch hold to that ray and try to make it wider but we do just the opposite with that attitude any fool imagines that he can sit in judgment on the highest things and deny the most profound experiences because why simply because i have not experienced this there cannot be anything <laughs> or egoistic <laughs> and arrogant than this assertion that i have not experienced it the only reply sometimes to such people is but i have you know you remember <laughs> swami vivekananda shubhend the quote this example someone told him that but shankaracharya doesn't say so so swami vivekananda said but i uh, say so why because he has experienced it that's why when shubhend says i have experienced maya bad but god went beyond it so one has to not invalidate and you know it it applies at many levels see what happens with children when they grow up and become part of a society many of them beautifully in their homes in their childhood are experiencing something but as they go into the world of the adult so called real world concrete world practical world pragmatic world it is a, oh this is nothing this this nothing no no don't pay attention to it and their attention is focused on to something else and they begin to lose contact they begin to doubt because all around they are being bombarded with this that well we have not experienced it whereas what the child should be taught or that well your experience is valid for you maybe nobody is experienced in the world but that's a thread given to you take hold of this thread and work it upward many children they have this beautiful imagination but later on they are told it's all an imagination you know so uh, it is certainly not by dissecting a body which is dead because the soul has departed from it that the soul can be found had the soul not departed the body would not have been dead so to start with but even a living body because the soul is living because of the life force that's how the mother describes it so the life force makes the body live the body lives because of the life force there are even instances where soul is departed and the person continues to live but it'll be like a bit deranged state very mechanically and habitually in fact there is a famous case of someone here benjamin who continued to live for at least an year even when the soul had departed the mother would tell say he would go to his room and they had uh, you know after he departed 
after he actually died he had departed one and a half years back and he was in a kind of psychologically deranged state and but mechanically he would do everything and then when he actually died physically so these people removed objects from his room then he came to mother and said you know they have shifted everything then mother said you actually don't need them <laughs> he used to go to his room not knowing that you know now there is no connection with the body and he used to be in a very interesting place nice place even a beautiful place and mother would tell this to the to his relatives so there are all kinds of instances even savitri describes such instances where people continue to live even after the soul has left but most of these people are completely deranged you know some or the other and they they are living very mechanically because the so is the soul which adds that sweetness warmth joy aspiration all these things it is to bring home to us the absurdity of this claim that shirobindo has written this aphorism it applies to all judgments of the critical mind and to all scientific methods when they would judge any but purely material phenomena so if you are um, trying to understand things based on senses then you have to uh, say that my field is only what my senses are showing and the soul is not felt by the material sense there are other senses with which we have to experience it and those senses are there in everyone we don't use the word senses how does one feel the touch of the divine sometimes or as if there was a presence is another sense only we have not developed it we in fact disbelieve in it so therefore we discard that experience so oh, maybe it was not true <laughs> so she says uh, it applies to all judgment the conclusion is always the same the only true attitude is one of humility so of course it's understood that uh, we won't know everything in the universe but instead of arrogantly discarding it passing a sensorial judgment we should have the attitude of humility of silent respect before what one does not know and of inner aspiration to come out of one's ignorance the right attitude is she is not saying you must believe you don't disbelieve believe but you should have the aspiration that there is so much i don't know the aspiration to know the aspiration to come in contact one of the things which would make humanity progress most would be for it to respect what it does not know but instead very often we see the arrogance that's what much of secular so called secular education is all about uh, i was very surprised i was reading how historically even on doordarshan at one point of time there used to be something like it started with krishna as music and you know it was stopped you know why because some people said no no it is not secular this all mythology yeah you know, many things like that why because it's mythology so many things why shouldn't we teach ramayan it's mythology so we should teach them about all the only real things that we see around is political dirt so this is how this uh, you know like for instance in political science i'm just taking a random example do we ever teach the political science as enunciated by krishna and rama forget all their other things how rama rama is a divine statesman how he deals with his opponents how he deals with kishkinda how he deals with people living in lanka just imagine that the enemy comes to rama somebody from the enemy camp vibhishan so how does rama respond to vibhishan uh, look at the diplomacy he addresses him as lankesh just imagine now this man is full of confidence now he knows that i am secure and then he simply makes him sit by his side you see isn't it such a beautiful divine diplomacy and after conquering he puts him on the throne so there are many lessons of politics from the rama ramayana and the mahabharata and it's a pity we don't teach it why because political science has to be according to the standard format so democracy was born in athens and brought out by europe this is so silly but this is how it is why because that is mythology so this is where she says there would be so much progress 
if we would respect what it does not know to acknowledge willingly that it does not know and is therefore unable to judge we constantly do just the opposite we pass final judgments on things of which we have no knowledge whatsoever and say in a peremptory manner this is possible that is impossible and so many things now we see from the i mean one of those examples is of course i am not saying that you should equate these things this way but look at it like you know there was a time when people would say are is a bagni astra brahmastra all this you know destruction but after the atom bomb even when the uh, man was the originator when the pilot saw that devastation and he recounted the phrase from the gita of the vishru and then when you read that how these were uh, in fact there are those astras which follow trail of the person on whom they are released and they have to go and hit the target regardless of how you are changing your your movement <laughs> we have uh, guided missiles so somewhere these things were there they remained in the memory of the race they were recovered and then they are expressing in another form obviously the form today is different that time it was a different form now it is a different form that is okay forms change but things were there so this tendency to discard and sensoriously say that is not possible she is saying that attitude leads us nowhere and makes us stuck in the ignorance when we do not even know what it is we are speaking of and we put on superior airs because we doubt things of which we have never had any knowledge and sometimes we even reduce things to our level of framework so i remember once in all india institute giving a guest lecture and some people say that yes yes what you say is this new being is going to come already see these transplants have started and now we have already these uh, he was very serious that there will be this new being with all mechanical organ replaced by machines so definitely man will become a another species i said yes but that's not evolution <laughs> <laughs> evolution is something different it's something which is permanently inbuilt <laughs> so um she says that people believe and we put on superior airs because we doubt things of which we have never had any knowledge men believe that doubt is a sign of superiority whereas it is really a sign of inferiority meaning thereby if you take the faith doubt equation faith is about doubt has its place you have in the says but doubt has its place supposing i believe that i am the king of the universe i should doubt myself <laughs> maybe i am uh, aggrandizing my ambition you know conceal the mission so doubt has its place even in science doubt and skepticism has their place but not on things which are superior to it in terms of uh, where the mind cannot reach or fathom there is another way to find them shobhinder the mother never say that you just believe it in fact indian uh, science and yoga doesn't say that you just believe them there is another way to discover them just like you cannot know the love in somebody's heart simply by asking give me a proof and the proof is measured by the uh, gold ring or what is the diamond ring that is presented to you you are likely to be fooled and cheated for good so because love is there in the heart but it it can express itself very differently look at shelley's poem that i cannot give you what men call love and yet what a profound deep love that we see expressed so she says that men believe that doubt is a sign of superiority whereas it is really a sign of inferiority so faith and then aspiration will to reach where what faith has already seen that should be the journey and doubt is below inferiority skepticism and doubt are two of the greatest obstacles to progress they add presumptuousness to ignorance so already there is ignorance but recognizing that i am ignorant being humble that way we can say that our a couple of generations earlier people were far more humble they admitted they don't know and therefore they could easily trust in ramayana in rama <laughs> anuman until science came and says there cannot be a person who will fly from one place to another and therefore it's all nothing but imagination 
I am sure some more time and people will say yes, this they start taking the checklist and say ye bhi ho sakta hai, this can be possible, this can be possible. <laughs> so this is how she says that instead of doubting, we must find what is the truth and there is an appropriate way of finding each truth. Material world, phenomenal truths if I may call it, factual phenomenal facts can be found by material methods. There the methods of science are valid. But deeper truths, subjective truths, psychological truths cannot be known by these methods. We cannot know the motive of a person simply by the action. Unless the person declares. And even then, we don't know whether he is telling a truth or a lie. We cannot know the intention of a crow, which way he is going to fly. We can analyze the wings and the whole course, but we cannot know the intention. Similarly, we cannot know what is still deeper than human psychology, the soul and the spirit. For that, we have to go still deeper. And then, we have to come in contact. So, there is a way to discover it, but that cannot be by the ways of material science. Namaste.